Good day everyone. Hopefully everyone's doing well this fall. Today's video is a follow-up one from an in-class assignment or kind of exercise walking through kind of the first steps in a pivot table. With that, the data set that I used for this one was from the University of Arkansas Police Department, UAPD, and it's all offenses through or from 2018 through 2020. I'll also link to the Cleary Act reporting for the university because Friday of last week and today's Monday, they released the 2020 Cleary Act report. Uh, to me, it's always interesting to look through and then talk to students about perceptions of and everything else associated with that. But this data set allows us to look at some of that data that ends up in the report in a very different fashion. And honestly, the data set you see in front of you provides greater context than the report itself, which is problematic on a number of fronts, but that's what they have to do and that's what they submit. So with that, I for this in-class assignment or exercise, we kind of went through a couple different formulas that have been used in prior weeks to show how you could visualize this in a different fashion, one being pivot tables. And I'm a huge fan of pivot tables, slicers, and charts from that. It makes your life a lot easier when you don't know some of the formulas or what you want to use at certain uh, points. With that, as you can see here, you have a couple different fields within it. So we have the incident number, which is unique, starts with the year within, and then the actual incident number, the report date, and the report time. Sometimes this is going to differ than our date began and date ended. Keep in mind, report date and incident day could vary, so keep that in mind in terms of what you want to look at in terms of space-time relationship. Today, I'm going to go over how to use a uh, temporal heat map, so day of week, hour of day kind of thing. With that, that matters. Uh, when we look at some of these, especially date began, date ended, if we think about some of our property crimes, and burglary is a common one, if you were traveling, came back, noticed something was taken from your property, it's going to take a couple days. So with that, you might have a varying degree of when that could have potentially started, so you'd begin date and date ended itself. Similar with time kind of thing with that. Uh, for today's purposes, we're going to use date began and time began as our two fields that we're going to use for time and date measures. The good and bad part is the location landmark. It is nice that UAPD captures this. At the same time, there's no uniformity to this. So depending on the officer that's inputting it, you're going to see different location landmarks. As you can see already in front of you, you have Bomb Stadium East Lot. Technically, those lots all have numbers and everything associated with that. Part of the Clary Act itself is also a geography part showing the university affiliated properties. With that, in the future, and I'll probably have some interns of GA kind of work on this, we can assign each one to a specific geography and actually visualize it. With it, we have too much officer discretion with, within what goes in this location landmark, so you can't easily aggregate it and see what it looks like across different buildings, lots, everything associated with that. It will be interesting to see since UAPD within Arkansas is NIBRS compliant and the state of Arkansas requires an address level field now for their NIBRS data. So I want to see how this turns out for say 2021 given kind of a lag period to get used to that reporting field. But there needs to be a level of standard or a drop down menu to where you can have these all be same. A lot of places deal with this same issue. It's just trying to keep constant when you're recording and reporting a landmark or a location that you've doing, done so in a uniform manner so you know what you're working with. That's why I create some issues here. All right, that tangent and kind of rant aside, if I want to come in and I want to tease out, say, day of week, month of year, and year, again, I'm going to insert three columns. And the key part is, since I already inserted these next to a date, you can see at the top here, the column itself is being grabbed as a date. So I want these to actually be general for the purposes of here today. And I'm also gonna do this when I insert one next to time began for hour. I want this one to be general as well. All right, so the key part again, if we want to pull out the text version of long day, what helps you identify the changes across three calendar years, I wanted to show the long date. So that's going to give me day of week, month of year, 
and then the year itself. So at the top, I'm just going to put the fields up here that I'm interested in, day, month, year, and then I'm going to go over an hour. So with that, if we just start typing in Monday, Monday, Wednesday, you can see it starts to autofill everything for us. Pretty cool that way, instead of having to use the flash fill version. So the other option would be go to data, flash fill after I got to one of these. Since it's next to a date field, Excel recognizes that I'm, there's a pattern. It's detecting that, it starts to fill it in for us and we're good to go. Now let's see if we can get the same thing to pop up for month. And let's see, that one didn't self-generate, so if I go to flash fill, gonna go down, you can see here the one that July where it changes mid, and I guess where all the Januarys, you can see that picked it up, the December one. So we're good to go there. And then year, again, we're just going to do, for this one, let's do the other way of our formula, year, and I wanna just grab the year from this date field itself. Again, that's 2018. That's what we wanted to see. The other option to autofill is just double click that and it will go downwards for us. And you can see here, even though the data says for 2018 and 2020, it wasn't reported until 2018 for this 2017 one, a couple of them, which gives us a case number and incident number also in 2018. These are things to be aware of with some of these data sets, especially if you're not used to using them as often. And this is one I haven't looked at too heavily a few times over the years. So with that, since we did use a formula here, what I oftentimes recommend, if you're already happy with that, go ahead and copy, and then you just wanna paste the values. By doing the paste values where it has the one, two, three, it gets rid of the actual formula you used where you told it, hey, Excel, use the year calculation to pull the year from this date, and it returns that for you. Now it just pastes the value, so you just have the year itself. We're gonna do the same thing with hours. So we have hour, and then we're just gonna click on our time field and hit enter and it grabs the hour for us in the same manner it did year. This one's just pulling the hour part. And we're lucky that it's already in military time, so we're good to go with that. Again, I'm going to copy and paste the values. So with that, we now have a data set that I wanna take into a pivot table. And I'll show you what we did in class and I'll show you a couple add-ons as well. Again, Pivot tables you can do a lot with. I'll have multiple videos on pivot tables. All right, so if I wanna highlight my entire data set, hold down Control Shift. Now, my colleague Katie pointed this out for why I never did this, but if I do Control Shift right, it highlights the variables themselves across the top, and then if I hit the down arrow, it does both. Previously, I'd always been dragging from one variable to the other, but if I just hold down Control Shift and then hit the right arrow and down arrow, it highlighted everything for us. So if I come over to insert, and I just click pivot table, I don't want anything recommended right now. Since I already have the data set highlighted, I don't have to do anything for the table range. Personally, I like it in a new sheet, so I'm good to go there, and it's gonna put it to the left of our query one table down here. Typically, I just relabel this as a pivot, just so I know. But what you see here is when you have anywhere clicked inside of the pivot table, you have the option over here to fill in different parts. You can apply filters, you can change what the columns are, the rows, and the values. Typically in the other video that I have on a pivot table, especially a temporal heat map, is what I did in terms of, I had day of week, so that's my column headers. So we have day here, and remember, not all of them have a value, so that's good to know, and we'll see that. And I was also interested in hour of the day. So we could see, in terms of crime patterning, typically certain days of the week, times of day, are at hotter periods for that. So it's pretty cool to see. Now you might wonder, well, we just have the outline of what we're interested in. We luck out that our incident number, each row is a specific incident, so we have a unique incident for that. If you drag and click this down here, you can see that it already comes in as a count measure. That's what we wanna see. Now say this was another measure that you wanna see the difference between oh, the average or the sum. You can change the field settings to other, these are kind of your descriptives of central tendency variability. So you can do a lot with this. You can change it how you want it to be shown and everything with that if it's a calculation. For us, it default is account and that's what we're good with here. What I would recommend, this is everyone's prerogative, in terms of day of week, you can always right click and move 
to end. So now we have Sunday at the end. I'm going to go ahead and hide. So I just right clicked on H itself and I want to hide this column just so I see our data here. So with that, if I highlight now from Monday at midnight, so think about zero being midnight, and I highlight just our values from Sunday at 11 p.m., conditional formatting, which is in the Home tab. If I come down to our color scales, and if I go to the second one, you can see that red's going to be where our high values are and green's going to be our lower values. So we can see hot points in terms of hour of day and day of week based on this. To me, that's a pretty cool, handy tool to have in terms of you can look at the numbers, but having a visualization with that always makes your life a bit easier. Now, you can even get into some fancy design options with it. Pivot tables itself have a lot that you can do with it. One that we'll get into down the line is a timeline. So we could do this by year, by month. Keep in mind, if I wanted to throw a year filter, so I'm grabbing year over here in the pivot table options. I want to have a filter, so it generated up here for us. Right now, it's grabbing everything. If I want to just select one year, let's say 2020, and compare this table then to the Cleary Act that was just released by the university, many of these incidents appear in that report to some degree. This is going to have more than just what's reported in there. And we can see how it's broken down based on time of day and day of week with that. Again, we can always remove the filter. So if you don't want the year anymore, if you come over to our table, just click on it and hit remove field. In a similar fashion, you can also do a slicer. So slicer is a fancy filter in some capacities. And say you want to do it based on specific offense descriptions. So I hit OK. It's now going to generate a list of all the offense descriptions that were within our table. It's a lot. And I say that because everything right now is highlighted. So say I was only interested in our battery offenses. So I click on battery and I want to have all three of them. You can see when those start to come in that way. So you can see across different crime types, it's slicing your data up so you can see it in a different way. And keep in mind, since we have the conditional formatting, it's updating with you. So it's pretty cool in that way. Obviously, we have campus data, so this isn't as common as some other types of crime. So let's see what well, burglary, start to see a bit more. Let's see if we can get into oh, driving while intoxicated. Just trying to find one that's much more common. That's not bad with driving intoxicated. It's interesting that's. Wednesday it becomes a peak period for that around 2 a.m. when the bars are closing though, so that also makes sense. So bars around Fayetteville have a 2 a.m. latest you can stay open kind of thing. So anything right after 2, so between 2 and 3 is where you're seeing kind of our peak periods, even on our 1 to 2 a.m. So that makes sense given that time point. You see an uptick during normal hours of the day throughout the weekend, so your Friday, Saturdays. I'm not, oh, it's still hiding Sunday from us. So unhide, there we go. We got a couple more in there. Oops. So we wanna see possession of drugs. That's typically what people on campus wanna look at. But if you select multiple types, you can start to see some of the hot periods. So our Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and think about it Sunday at midnight makes sense. It's our Saturday night going into it. Depending on the crime type itself, you might see an influx come Monday at midnight. Because think about it, if people went out on a Sunday night, it goes into Monday morning. You might see an uptick in some of your Monday early morning counts because of that. Public intoxication, not too bad there. I expected a bit more, especially on campus. But the cool part is just seeing how you can kind of take all of these data and apply different, essentially, filters, slicers to it. You can always select all. Oops. And everything comes back to normal to the 2851 over the three years in terms of report date. Again, this is just a quick example of what we did in class as an exercise. 
the key part is when you're working in pivot tables itself, I'm going to delete the slicer part, is understanding what you want as a row versus hour. So think about in terms of if you were to print some of this off, and especially the example that's in the homework, some things are going to look better as rows versus columns. So say I was interested in, oh, let's take out the hour and put the offense description. You can see once I put that in there and go across, it goes all the way down to EC, so it's replicated multiple times across. It's not going to print well this way. So what I'd recommend is then if we're thinking about visualization and how people ingest this information or digest, by changing it to where rows are our fence description and then still across the top we have day of the week, we can now see what that looks like itself. And we can also do it, so say I didn't even want to have um, the day of week. If I just remove day of week here, I still get a count based on the incidents itself. The key part is, and you can always sort a specific way, but another way is if you just want to see, similar from the past conditional formatting, use the same scale so you can identify where some of the high ones are, theft of property, looks like our highest one, yeah, followed by arrest on warrant, but it's a good way to understand some of your data, some of the descriptive statistics to it, the frequency of. Again, this is just a follow-up to what was done in class. I'll provide additional videos on pivot tables throughout the semester and going forward because pivot tables in terms of aggregation and summary and understanding data is a great tool to become comfortable with. And you can do a lot with them. Again, I'm not going to cover everything depending on what your necessity or need is. You can ask me to make a video, but keep in mind these videos are typically geared towards the class that I'm teaching. In this case, it's an introduction to secondary data. Many of the students haven't even had our stats course yet, so the familiarity with, be it Excel, SPSS, Stata, SAS, is limited. So this is truly a hands-on course with this. I'm not trying to throw everything at students at once. With that, have a good day. Until next time.